special meeting of the 2022 Elected Official Compensation Commission. Uh, I'm Michael Kastler, the chair of the commission, and uh, I'm retired, a former city employee. Um, and uh, to my left are the two of the other four commissioners um, that are members of this commission. We'll go around and introduce ourselves and then staff from the city as well. Please introduce yourself. Sarah. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Ingalls. I am a labor attorney um, with a law firm called Wentz McInerney Pfeiffer Petroff. And I am the board president of the Central Ohio Worker Center. So I am very excited to be a part of this commission and um, think through you know, how we're paying our electeds and uh, whether it is competitive in the market. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Keisha Hunley Jenkins and I um, work with the Equity Now Coalition as a management consultant, which is focused on achieving uh, parity for black people here on several indicators here in Franklin County and in the city of Columbus. I also work with Dr. James Moore at the Ohio State University uh, we have a partnership with City Council called the Boys and Young Men of Color Collective, where we are working with boys and young men of color throughout Franklin County and particularly in Columbus to have identify policy changes that will close persistent opportunity gaps that they face. I too am excited to be here as a Columbus native um, and really excited for our new council members um, and what we'll be able to do going into the future um, in this time of great change. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Richard Blunt from the Office of the Mayor. Good morning, my name is Robert Tobias. I am with the uh, Columbus City Attorney's Office in the General Counsel section. I've been a city employee for the last 28 years. 25 of those years were uh, as a prosecutor in the uh, prosecutor division of the City Attorney's Office in a variety of capacities. And for the last three years, I've been with the General Counsel section and I basically represent a variety of city agencies and departments and hopefully provide good legal advice and keep everybody out of trouble. And uh, I've been tasked by chief counsel to serve as the legal counsel for the commission and I'm happy to do that. Glad to be here. Good morning, my name is Darlene Wilds. I'm the deputy city auditor. I've been with the uh, city of Columbus for about 20 years, um, serving under uh, auditor Kilgore since 2018. Um, I will be um, offering any information that you need on revenue projections for the city um, as you move forward with your deliberations. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Greg Beaverson. Uh, I am in the Department of Human Resources. I serve as the city's compensation manager. Uh, altogether, I've been with the city of Columbus for 15 years, uh, four of which in the Department of Finance, and then I've been in human resources for the rest of the time. I'm here to serve as your uh, resource for anything compensation related uh, research questions that you may have uh, what I often call a, a comp 101 course uh, 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 for anybody who needs to know anything about compensation um, I like to serve as your resource thank you thank you everyone good morning my name is Naya Walters and I will be serving as staff lead from Columbus City Council um, I am in-house counsel to council and I'm a legal analyst in their legislative research office um, welcome, everyone. I would like to thank you all for being here um, to work on the Elected Officials Compensation Commission. Uh, Chair Kasser, I would like to turn it over to you for any remarks you may have before I head into the charter provisions. Thank you, Naya. Um, Naya has prepared for us a, a proposed uh, uh, agenda for today and future meetings. Um, I, unless uh, the commissioners have an objection to that, I would propose that we go through her to-do specified uh, and her uh, uh, schedule uh, for today. Um, and then at the end of our meeting today, we can discuss uh, the future meetings, uh, scope of work, and uh, any and everything that the commissioners may, may want to bring up, okay? Uh, so if there are no uh, other objections, I'm going to turn this over to Naya uh, for her uh, uh, presentation. Thank you, Chair Kassler. Um, so I just wanted to bring to your attention Columbus City Charter sections 15.1 through sections 15.5. 
Um, these are the charter provisions that will guide your work. Um, and so it talks about how often the commission does this, when they should do it, um, and who this applies to. So this applies to the salary for council members, the auditor, the city attorney, the mayor, and council president. Um, so it fixes the salary of the compensation of all employees and officers of the city government um, in those roles. Um, and so this is what you are here to kind of suggest for the next several years. There was a commission that started, started in 2015 um, and there was a secondary commission in 2018. And so this commission meets every four years to set elected official compensation. Um, they set compensation further removed from when they actually are doing their work. So for the 2018 commission, their recommendations apply to 2022 through 2025. Um, and so your recommendations will follow those. So your recommendations will begin in 2026. Um, so with that in mind, keep in mind that at that time, we will also have nine council members um, per issue three um, and the council residential districting process, which was just completed. Um, so just keep that in mind when you are thinking about this work that this will apply to not just seven council members, but nine council members in total. Um, for commission membership, there are two commission members that are selected by the mayor's office, two selected by the Columbus City Council, and the chair of the commission is selected by both the council and the mayor jointly. Um, this commission selects a review of salaries for these um, commissions from like sectors in the public, like positions in the public sector, and they're made for the purposes of recommending salaries for the appropriate duties and responsibilities of each elective officer of the city. Um, within three months, you are tasked to complete this work. So for us, um, with us meeting here on June 19th, it's three months from appointment. So it's, the clock technically started running on January 10th when you guys were appointed. Um, the three month period will end the week of April 4th. So we are tasked with having a report to submit to council by that time. Um, this will include a cost of annual cost of living adjustment, which shall not exceed the annual average of the consumer price index and the successor thereto in the preceding four years. Uh, we will get into more information about the consumer price index and all of those functions um, when we meet with uh, likely uh, Bill Lafayette from Re Regionomics, who will discuss kind of the COLA, which is the cost of living um, adjustment, as well as the consumer price index to kind of give you a better understanding of how um, salaries are, are coming into fruition. Like, what are we looking at? How this information um, kind of come together to create the salary. So all of that information is what we will be learning um, over the next several weeks as we prepare our recommendations. Um, lastly, uh, once the report is submitted, council by ordinance has to either accept the recommendations or any portion of them or reject them the same. If council does reject the recommendations, the salary shall remain in effect unchanged. Um, council cannot adopt an or ordinance establishing salaries which exceed the recommendations of the commission. So those are kind of the parameters of our work. Um, are there any questions from the commissioners um, or staff regarding kind of the charge set forth in the charter? Okay, thank you, Naya. Uh, we'll move along to uh, city attorney's uh, presentation on open meetings law. Rob? So while Naya is getting the uh, PowerPoint organized, I'll just let you know that I've created a, a PowerPoint presentation that is primarily geared towards um, new area commissioners. I've been doing that training for a couple of years now, twice a year, with COVID more recently virtually. Um, and it's uh, geared more towards the general public that may just not have a lot of familiarity or understanding with how local gov you know, government works and local government works. So I'll just give a general apology in advance if it seems like it's too simplistic. <laughs> um, you folks probably have a lot more understanding of open meetings and public records than some of the individuals who uh, volunteer to serve on the area commissions. And so uh, if I'm going too fast, stop me, but uh, it, it's just, this is just supposed to be a basic overview. Um, my role here as well, I, you know, I've spoken with um, Adam Friedman, who is also with the city attorney's office, and I believe served as legal counsel for the commission the last time around. And um, his indication was that, you know, we just kind of stay out of the way and we're here to serve you. And so if you have legal questions as you're working through, uh, you can certainly reach me by phone, email at these meetings. Um, but uh, it's usually a hands-off process for me and I just am here to answer questions as they come up. 
having said that, if I see that you're doing anything really incorrect or may run afoul of the law, I'll certainly speak up, but uh, the likelihood of that occurring is probably pretty low. I'm ready when you are. It should be popping up on the screen at any moment now. Great. I think I cut at least 15 slides out of the presentation when I tweaked it for this commission, so hopefully it shouldn't take too long to load. And again, I'm actually, I can wing it too if you need me to. I can just give you the highlights. Um, or I can stand up and just look at the monitor and ask the commissioners to turn around if that works easier. And I can even use the clicker to advance the slide or just ask them to advance the Whatever's easier for you. That's, that's fine. It usually should pop up. I'm not sure. They were having some technical difficulties yesterday, so it might still be a little bit of the same. Um, goes out and it goes out a week sometimes two weeks before the actual meeting takes place on Saturdays in the city bulletin and so that is the notification there is also an advisory a media advisory that goes out um, from our communications team that lets the public know to, through the listserv that this meeting is taking place okay thank you sure Rob, they can't hear you. Can you can you speak into one of the mics that are in front of you because they, they can't hear you on the screen? Is that better? Okay, great. Um, so yeah, special or emergency meetings, you need to have um, more notice or 24 hours notice and you need to put the purpose of the special meeting. Next slide. Open to the public, what does that mean? You can see it has to, the public body has to make the meetings open to the public. They need to be able to see and know, uh, see and hear and participate. I just put a couple examples of what's not allowed. Secret ballots, whispering, round robin discussions, things of that nature are not allowed. The only exception to uh, open to the public is executive session. You can go to the next slide. It lists uh, the reasons why you would go into executive session. Again, I don't think any of those things are going to apply here. Um, and if you do go into executive session, you would need to follow a proper procedure to do that. And again, I'm happy to provide legal guidance if that becomes necessary. Next slide. Another important thing about open meetings is minutes. Uh, I believe Naya is gonna be the individual uh, taking those minutes. If I'm wrong, Naya, just correct me. Uh, but 
you can see here the requirements for the minutes have to be properly, uh, promptly prepared, filed, maintained, open to the public. They don't need to be verbatim transcripts as long as they're capturing uh, with enough detail, you know, what happened during each meeting. And so if somebody didn't watch the meeting, they could check out the minutes and have some basic understanding and appreciate uh, the rationale behind, you know, what happened at the, at the meeting. So Robin, a, oh, go ahead, Chair. In, in, in that case, uh, the commission members would, at a subsequent meeting, they would approve the uh, minutes of the previous meeting? Is yes, right? again, uh, if I'm speaking at a turn now, you'll let me know, but I'm assuming on the agenda for all the subsequent meetings, one of the first things you'll do is approve the minutes from the previous meeting. Right. Thank so you. it's my understanding that if you have a video recording and it's being streamed like it is now, you don't have to actually, actually have to have written minutes. If you choose to do so, that's fine. But because everything is video recorded and streamed, you have a living record that lives on um, the council YouTube, or the city YouTube, excuse me. Um, and so you can refer to that for all of the meeting minutes. That's correct. Uh, if you have an actual recording of the meeting itself, that would be better than minutes. And so would, yes, would qualify. Next slide. Um, so then moving into public records. Uh, so basically Public Records Act uh, allows for the public inspection of um, records kept by state and local governments. Uh, there's a distinction made, open meetings apply to public bodies, public records apply to public offices. Uh, in this instance, the commission would constitute a public office. It's created by charter. Um, there are certain records that are excluded. There's all kinds of exemptions in the Pu Public Records Act. Um, I, again, I don't, there's a possibility that some records here may qualify. We can certainly uh, explore that uh, as they come up. And um, there are enforcement measures if uh, a request is improperly denied. You know, it, the, as a good lawyer, it depends. You know, um, so if you're just starting. Angles, can you speak into a mic? Because we can't hear you um, when you speak. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, my question was whether our personal notes as commissioners are considered public record. And the answer is it depends. You know, sometimes if there's notes you're scratching down on a post-it note that just help you follow a discussion, those might not be considered public records. But if there's notes that you're saving and keeping that may be used to help you uh, in the preparation of a final report, those types of notes might be something that you would want to retain. So if you ever have a question, just ask. Next slide. Uh, so we've just talked about that. Yes, the uh, commission is a public office. Next slide. So what's considered a public record? This is in the Ohio Revised Code, section 149.011G. It's just basically document, device, item, regardless of the form that's um, created or received by the commission, which is serving to document the organization or functions, policies, decisions, procedures, operations, or other activities uh, of the commission. Um, it's important to note that something needs to meet all three sections, all three parts of the definition to qualify uh, as a public record. And again, if you ever have any questions about whether something applies, just let me know. Next slide. And for your purposes, these are the items that I've noted will probably qualify as a public record. Um, and again, we talk about minutes, the recording needs to be maintained as a public record. The documents that NIA created for today in terms of the agenda for the meeting, those types of things need to be maintained as public records. If you receive any information from other agencies in the city that are giving you documents to assist you in your work, those would be considered um, public records, any kind of reports from committees or subcommittees. We talked about the recordings and then obviously the final report that you issue in April is definitely going to be a public record. Next slide. And then there's a requirement to maintain records. It's basically called a retention schedule. And I was trying to think about, you know, what schedule would apply here. And I think the most logical one would be a council, would be the uh, retention schedule that applies to council. Um, and uh, so I'll talk with Naya about that and make sure that we're complying by retaining the things that we need to be retaining for the time period which we need to be retaining them for. Next slide. And so compliance with a public records request, I think the thing that's important to know here is anyone can make a request. They don't have to identify themselves. It can be anonymous. They can do it through text or email or phone or in person. Um, there's no requirement that they have to do it in a certain way or they need to identify themselves. They don't even have to explain why they want it. They can just make the request. The requests do need to have some measure of specificity. They can't just be overly broad. 
Um, it is perfectly fine for the commission to ask for more detail from somebody who makes a public records request if you feel like it's an overly broad request and or you're not sure exactly what it is they're asking for. Um, records can be made available in person for inspection or copies can be provided. I've dealt with public records requests where people want it loaded onto a flash drive or emailed in a file in a zip drive to them so um, the person can indicate in which way they want to receive the records. And then only existing records must be provided. That's important too. You don't need to create a new Excel spreadsheet or document or chart to comply with the request, only records that currently exist. And I think there's just one more slide. When to ask me for help, <laughs> basically, as I indicated, if it's unclear what records are being asked for, or there's uncertainty whether there's some sort of an exemption from disclosure, or if you feel like there's something in a document that should be redacted, social security number, bank account, things like that. Um, and, uh, or if you get a, a communication from the requester or their counsel that you're not complying, let me know about that kind of stuff. I think that's it. And there's my contact information if you uh, need to reach me for any reason. I'm on the city's global email list. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Robert. Uh, I'd, I'd like to talk for a moment with the commissioners about uh, this, this matter of uh, meeting minutes. <clears throat> As Naya said, uh, the uh, recording uh, could represent that. However, I'm, I'm thinking if we wanted to refer back to uh, what we did at our last meeting, uh, or if the public wanted to as well, um, it would be very laborious and time consuming to go back and refer to a uh, maybe a two hour meeting uh, to figure that out. And to that end, Naya, I'm, I'm thinking we should have a, a brief uh, meeting minutes that would recognize uh, topic areas that are being discussed and would, would uh, uh, record any motions that were made and passed or defeated? Should we do that? I'm happy to do that. Um, I don't know if there'll be many motions being made because I think your final work is a recommendation. And so um, you would likely only be making motions at the end to move to, uh, to approve the recommendations to submit them to council, just, just for um, clarity. But I'm happy to do a brief um, meeting minutes if that's what you'd like. Sure. Okay, in, any discussion? Only that I agree from an accessibility standpoint. I know that some folks might not have time to watch or be able to view or listen to the video in that way. So I think having a written summary could be helpful to a lot of folks. And, and really, Naya, I think the written summary could, could be, uh, in some instances, very brief. Just a, a notation of uh, what the various agenda items were that, for instance, the city attorney's uh, uh, representative uh, went through the uh, public meeting records uh, for our uh, understanding and review. Sure, I'm happy to do that. Okay, fine, thank you. Um, let's move on to uh, Mr. Beaverson and a presentation on uh, current uh, compensation of elected officials. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm not sure how much of a presentation it is, but uh, the, the information that you have there in front of you uh, is what I'll be going over. And please feel free to uh, uh, stop me at any point and ask any questions uh, that you might have. Uh, and, and, and also, please let me know if you'd like me to um, be more specific, more detailed in the information that I'm providing. Um, what we're looking at here, uh, first page, is the current compensation of elected uh, officials um, as of uh, January 1st of, of this year. Does everyone have that? Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. we're, we're talking about the, this document here, Oh, no, right? I, I'm sorry. There's another document. It's been stapled. Okay. Uh, and at the gotcha. top, it says current compensation of elected officials. Thank as you. Of one. Okay, got it. And um, there, there's... It might appear as an anomaly, <laughs> so I thought I would uh, go over that at first. Um, what you're seeing there is, uh, and again, it's the five um, positions um, uh, of mayor, city council president, council member, city attorney, and city auditor. Uh, each of those, uh, the, the um, amounts are shown 
um, annual salaries are shown for each. But in parentheses, you'll see that there is an increase of a, a certain percentage. And I, I just wanted to take a, a minute or so to explain that. Uh, at the last commission um, meeting in, uh, or excuse me, the last commission in 2018, uh, it was decided that instead of a cost of living adjustment uh, for 2022, and uh, a, a percentage increase, a broad across the board kind of percentage increase would be provided for each of the elected officials. That percentage increase was given this year. So it's, what, 19 days old. Um, typically, since the commission was uh, first met in 2015, that was only a cost of living adjustment each year. And uh, I, I, I actually don't have those percentages, but uh, they, they ranged from, going by my memory here, 1.25% uh, up to 1.5, 1.6% per year. And there's a formula that we, that, that we utilize uh, to calculate that. But this stands out um, with these percentage increases. Um, and, and the reason for, for that, uh, my recollection with the last commission, uh, is that there was some um, catching up to do in comparison with other cities. And that's the reason for these percentage increases. What you so, so, so just to be clear, yes. so these percentage increases have nothing to do with COLA? That's correct, Mr. Okay. Chairman. That's correct. Uh, under that, the salary schedule set, <clears throat> pardon me, by the 2018 commission. Uh, of course, what you see there, and this is the way it actually appears in the ordinance. Um, what you see there are the current amounts with a COLA added per year. Uh, that COLA, that, um, that amount is based on the consumer price index at the end of the year. So, of course, um, we don't have that information yet in order to calculate it. And then you'll see that that's effective on January 1st um, this year and for the next three years as well. well if I could ask a question about the COLA. Is, how does the COLA work in subsequent years? Is it, is it compounded or is it uh, just a COLA added to the specified uh, salary? Uh, y yes, Mr. Chairman, it's, um, for, for example, um, this year with these percentage pay increases, um, next year the COLA will be added to the current year amount. It will be that and that only. Um, so there will be, I don't know, let's just take, take a percentage, for, a, for example, let's say 1.75% um, will be added. The following year, in 2024, the COLA for that previous year, 2023, will be added to that amount with the 1.75%. So it, it, it is compounding. Okay, yes. thank you. Yes, you're welcome. So again, I, I know this is just a, a broad overview, but certainly if you have any uh, additional questions uh, throughout. Um, I, I'm on uh, page two now. And, and what, what we were trying to do is just provide some very basic information for you. What, what you see next there is the health insurance. And, and this is where I like to stop and, and just um, describe very briefly uh, how uh, health insurance works and employee groups uh, work here. Um, at the City of Columbus has uh, essentially nine different employee groups. Six of them are union groups. Um, the health insurance is a different cost based on negotiations and, and other reasons. Um, the, all of the elected officials are in something we call the Management Compensation Plan, and we shorten that to MCP. MCP uh, has one amount, uh, and as you can see here for health insurance, one for single, one for family, for uh, all employees, including the elected officials. Uh, and, and that's what you see uh, here. It's broken out both by uh, monthly and annual. And, and I did wanna uh, stop and, and just put a, a caveat there because there are always caveats. <laughs> I, I will be saying that the entire time this commission is uh, in session, uh, is that 
there, there is uh, an, not, not an exception, it's a different rule for anyone who was hired prior to October 1st, 2017, and anyone who was hired on October 1st, 2017 and after. And there, I'm certain, are a variety of reasons for that. I'm not the um, uh, benefits uh, manager or anything like that, but, um, but uh, th there is a different amount for anyone hired before 2017 October 1st and a different amount for anyone hired afterward. So I, I thought I'd mention that. And I, I believe these are for after October 1st, 2017. Do, do you recall? Um, I believe so. These are the ones they used last time. So they were in the 2018. So I believe that these would have been done yes. after the 2017 yes. date. And, and it basically represented a uh, an increase for new employees because we all know health insurance is has, has risen and continues to rise. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, we often get questions about uh, OPERS, the Ohio Public uh, Employees Retirement System. So we put that information here. Uh, Columbus pays 14% of the employee's salary. The employee pays 10% of their salary. So 24% uh, of the salary, including elected officials, goes to the re, uh, retirement system, the pension. After that, the uh, benchmark cities uh, identified and contacted by the 2018 commission, there are 24 of them listed there. <clears throat> the previous commission in 2015, I believe, believe had several more. Uh, this will be up to each of you to, to decide. Um, certainly we can discuss uh, all of the different uh, and, and many aspects of uh, choosing a particular jurisdiction over another jurisdiction. Um, I, I can say that uh, we have uh, seven, what, what I've always called core peer cities uh, that, that we have, we generally compare ourselves with. Um, they're, they're, yes, they're regional, but we also have to go beyond um, Ohio and we have to go beyond the Midwest in order to find other cities that are comparable simply in size with Columbus but certainly we don't look just at, at size, we look at familiarity as well. So that will be uh, something I'm sure that, uh, actually I think um, we have that scheduled for the next commission meeting to go into a little more in depth. Uh, and just so you know, um, my counterparts, um, I, I have colleagues at, uh, I think I've got a list of 55, maybe 60 different cities where I know and am in and I'm in contact with my counterpart there on a consistent basis. We're always asking each other back and forth for salary data, uh, job matches, uh, and that kind of thing. So um, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a good reciprocal uh, arrangement to have, um, but I, I do have to tell you up front that sometimes we can try all we want um, and, and call and email. Uh, sometimes we just get uh, cities that don't respond. And, and that's just kind of the nature of, uh, of surveying. Let's see, on the back, I believe this is the last page. And what's listed there, uh, 2018 survey questions. I, again, most of this information is from last time. Uh, certainly there was um, some different information from 2015, especially since that one was the uh, very first commission meeting. But in 2018, this is a very good uh, example of questions that we asked in the survey. And I can go over each one of those or, or you can read those. Um, and, I, and, I, I yes, do have a question about, yes. uh, this is maybe one of my pet peeves, but oftentimes when uh, uh, Budgets are looked at. They refer to the general fund. Yes. Uh, as, as Darlene knows, that uh, <laughs> there are some pretty big other funds that uh, the city operates. Notably, water and sewer comes to mind, uh, and that seems to always be overlooked uh, when they talk about these numbers. Uh, what a water and sewer uh, fund may be just as big as the uh, general fund in, in in rough numbers. Correct. Want to speak to that? Yeah. Um. Yes, it, it could be as big for sure. I mean, ours isn't as big as the general fund, but but yes, it could be. 
So for instance, in some cities, uh, there's a, 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 a sewer district, water and sewer district, that the city has no operational responsibilities or oversight for. In Columbus, however, that's not the case. Uh, so to the extent that you can recognize those distinctions, I think it would be useful in, in uh, understanding the, uh, the size of the dollar amounts that uh, the, our public officials are dealing with. Yes, Mr. Chairman, we can certainly do that. Um, at, at your request, we can um, uh, s set up different uh, questions and, and to, to I'm, identify I'm that sorry, I'm sorry, I'm not really trying to make uh, uh, extra work for you. Oh, Although no, you're sitting there thinking you're making extra work for me. Uh, <clears throat> but to the extent that that, that that is recognized may be useful in doing comparables. Right, and, and, and I, I actually agree completely with you, and, and please don't ever think that anything that you would request uh, of me or my office is extra work. It's not. I'm, I'm here to provide the information that you, that you need to make the best decisions. Um, on, on that point, we actually did ask um, about the, um, the comparable city's capital budgets uh, as well. Um, and, and in the next commission meeting, I'll have a presentation where we can discuss um, you know, all of the different similarities and differences among different jurisdictions, how, how deeply do you want to go? Because we can keep going um, to, to make a, 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 a very accurate list, but um, at some point it becomes um, almost counterproductive where we spend more time on finding out which cities are most similar uh, to Columbus uh, instead of going out and, and doing the work. Uh, and, and, but, but we can certainly go down as far down that rabbit hole as you would like to go. But I'll, I'll have some examples uh, more specifically at the next commission. Well, meeting. like you say, it, it, it can be a rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. But I just, I just think that it's, it's important to understand the depth of uh, responsibility that uh, Columbus elected officials have around Definitely. that matter. Definitely. Okay, so those are the sur survey questions, and I just wanted to point it out, uh, point out there um, the second bullet point, major one there, the specific questions for each elected official. Uh, so sometimes uh, one elected official isn't going to have obviously the same responsibilities as, as another one does. So uh, my recollection is that the last commission uh, came up with a few different questions for individual elected officials. For for example, um, one that comes to mind is. Um, not every city has an auditor, as we term an auditor. They have um, maybe a controller, um, or they have an auditor who specifically only audits and doesn't do what our city does, uh, and what, our, what our city auditor does. That, that's just one example. Um, certainly, uh, one big uh, consideration is whether the person or the, the position is elected or not. So that's one question we get out of the way very early uh, is we probably don't want your salary data, thank you anyway, uh, if that particular job isn't elected. Uh, some cities have appointed city attorneys, for example, instead of elected ones. So do we want to compare ourselves with them? Maybe, maybe not. That would be a decision that the commission would make. And unless there are any other questions, I believe that's, that's all I have for you today. Just one quick question. How are you determining COLA? I know that's a step back from what you already. Y yes, um, yes, Commissioner. The, uh, the COLA is determined by a, uh, a formula mm -hmm. that was provided by Mr. Lafayette, Dr. Lafayette, um, at the very first commission. And okay. then it was um, decided by the commissioners that that formula would be used. Um, and then the same um, exercise took place during the 2018 commission. And I believe if Dr. Lafayette is the person who, the, the economist who comes to brief you uh, on, on that, um, you'll have the opportunity to, to um, recheck that formula and, and make sure that that's okay. Okay, thank you. I, and, but I'm sorry, I don't have it here in front yeah, of me. That's okay, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Commissioners, I also just wanna provide that the meeting minutes, uh, meeting agenda materials, and the um, presentations that the last commissions in 2018 and 2015 have come up with, they're, all, they're also in those links that I sent you. 
Um, and so some of those kind of walk through um, how the COLA works, how the consumer price index works. So I, I encourage you to take a little bit of time to kind of do those. Of course, he'll be here to explain them in more, um, in more depth, but I thought that was helpful to me and just kind of preparing myself to familiarize myself. Um, and then, uh, Mr. Beaverson, if you don't mind just kind of giving uh, the commission an idea of like a timeline. I know that today um, I wanted us to spend part of our time kind of thinking about which cities um, he should begin thinking, which, which cities he should begin thinking about to reach out to, um, because that does take a little bit of time to get those numbers back. Um, so I was hoping that we kind of dig into that today, but I did want him to give kind of an overview of what um, the timeline looks like so that can let you all know kind of when you're going to do some firmer decisions based on what you need to um, uh, use for admission. Uh, that's, that's a very, very good point. Um, t typically, uh, for, first of all, I guess I should tell you that we are constantly surveying other cities. We're constantly surveying those core peer cities that, um, that, that I mentioned uh, and others because not everybody uh, has the same classifications, same jobs that we have. Uh, we currently, I believe this number is right, we currently have 657 different classifications, and that actually does not count the five elected officials. Um, so um, when we go out to look for this information, um, we, we have rules about you know, what percentage of the duties have to match. We never do just job titles. Uh, we never look at just pay ranges. We look at actual salary data. And again, this is more information that I'll provide you um, later. But, but it's very important that we get good um, feedback in a timely manner. Um, the problem is that with so many different jobs, and we're constantly looking at these, um, you, you can't really go to, you know, come to expect that another city or group of cities is going to get back to you right away. They all are doing other things just like we're doing other things. Uh, for, for example, I think in my inbox I've got maybe six different surveys um, that have been sent to me for me to give Columbus data to, uh, to other cities. Um, in, in a survey such as this, where it's fairly detailed, it's only uh, f uh, five, five jobs, but it's, it is fairly detailed, normally we like to give a few weeks for, for cities to do that. I believe in 2018 we, um, we gave a, a three-week window. Does that sound right from what you remember? That I, sounds right. From yeah, I, I think it was three weeks. Uh, is what we ask, and, and we've got everything spelled out, and, and here it is. And I, and I even make requests, or I even tell other uh, cities, uh, if you have this information out online, certainly let me know, and I can go out and get the information. I know I appreciate that when other cities go and, and, and do that, um, and, and then I can just provide salary data. I can um, provide employee counts and things like that. But to, to get around to a, a, a long way of answering the question, um, two to three weeks is probably a very good amount of time to allow other cities uh, to look at, kind of digest, and then provide this information. So to that end, uh, and your point, Naya, uh, you would like us to identify cities today so Greg can uh, proceed with... Uh, soliciting information from them? That's correct. I would like you to take a look at the list of states that we've already used in 2018. If there are any that stick out to you that you would like to use again, or there are some that you already have in your mind that you would like to look into. Um, just because I want us to kind of have information, just recognizing that we're kind of on a tighter timeline in terms of time available. So I thought it would be helpful to kind of discuss that and talk through some of those factors now so that hopefully by the next time we meet, he will have some data. He may not have all of it, but he may be able to get some of it start, starting to flow in, and it'll continue to flow in as we continue to meet. Okay. Commissioners, uh, do you have a, an attitude about uh, what in this list you want to make sure is uh, 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 covered with uh, their survey? I, I, uh, I think... Go ahead. I, I think we definitely want to know Cincinnati, Cleveland... Um, the other large Ohio cities. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner. I suppose I should mention why Columbus is in there. Yeah. <laughs> Columbus is there because this came from a spreadsheet 
where all of the data was collected. And of course, we wanted to put our own data in there to compare ourselves, obviously. So yeah, we probably should have left Columbus out, but that, that's why Columbus is there. That makes sense. Um, but I definitely think at least those two cities, um, And, and I, I believe that we should include some cities out of the region, um, such as Austin mm -hmm. and Nashville. Yes. And uh, as, as well, uh, uh, Pittsburgh and Indianapolis. Now, I don't, I don't mean to necessarily exclude anything, but those are ones that... that um, that appear to me as I look down through the list that well we should we should see what what their numbers are yeah so I'm not you know I'm in favor of whatever you all identify as benchmark <coughs> cities certainly whatever you said but also those of comparable size across the country mm -hmm. and then I also since our the whatever recommendations the commission comes up with won't be active until you said 2026 is that right that's the correct. first year that the compensation from these recommendations could be implemented. That's correct, Commissioner. I just wonder, you know, since I think if Columbus is a 14th largest city, what are we projected to be at that time? And then that might indicate which of the larger cities we need to be asking about since we're kind of forecasting. Just to provide um, a little bit of information. So my previous work was on the commission for the redistricting commission. And over the last 10 years, Columbus amassed roughly 118,000 in population. And so that's roughly about five years from now um, so we'll be at the halfway point. So I don't know if that provides you any like idea of like starting to think about like, you know, what are we on track to do and what could we possibly do in the next five years with the information knowing that Columbus has grown according to the 2020 census by 118,000 people in the last 20 years. So I think that you could, you know, start to think of it as like, okay, we could potentially amass 50,000 more people in the next five years um, if we continue to grow at the rate and track that we've been growing at. I don't know if that was helpful or not. Well, I'm certain, you know, whatever analysis goes into it, I mean, I will leave that to your best judgment. I obviously, I don't know. I would have to look that up and come back with some things. But I do think, again, if we talk, keep talking about Columbus being the fastest growing in the state and the region, all those sorts of things, since we're setting this for so far out, I would just like to make sure. And maybe it's only up to the 12th largest, or, you know, maybe it's only a couple more cities. I don't mean to go all the way to the largest city, but just taking that into consideration. I would also be interested in Denver um, as a comparable. And, and the one in the region I think I, I've overlooked uh, that should be included on the list, I think, is Detroit. Yeah. Uh, also, commissioners, I thought I would mention, um, I, I didn't bring it as a separate list, but I've identified those, that list of core peer cities, and, and I, I wanted to point them out to you. Um, I think you've actually already identified all of them, if, if not all, uh, several of them. Um, starting at the, toward the top, uh, Baltimore, Charlotte, Denver, Detroit, Indianapolis, Louisville, and I believe that's it. Four, six, seven. Um, I, I do communicate quite a bit with Nashville yeah. as well. And, and just so you know, over the years, um, m mostly those comparisons, um, for, for a variety of reasons, mostly those comparisons have come from union negotiations. Mm -hmm. Six different unions, and that's kind of what we're doing most of the time uh, in terms of labor relations. It's, it's, uh, it's looking at comparator cities for a variety of different reasons. So, so it's got to start somewhere. That's sort of the, the, the beginning point. But I, I could go through and, and give you similarities uh, to Columbus. Um, it, and certainly, we're always going to find differences. Um, a lot of people ask about Austin. You know, Austin is all the way down south and, or west in, in Texas. Um, Austin is uh, almost exactly the same size as Columbus. I don't remember if they're 13 or 15. It kind of goes back and forth. Uh, every year, it seems. Um, extremely fast growing, very similar in terms of industry. Uh, 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 s several of the same industries that we have here are also in Austin. Uh, economy is very similar. It's a state capital. 
Uh, it is the uh, seat of a very large uh, state university, just like what we have here. Uh, so lots of similarities, even though it's all the way over in Texas. Um, D Denver is similar. Um, Indianapolis certainly is. Um, and, and then there was one other thing I wanted to point out. Um, I, I could talk about these these things all day long, so you just have to kind of put your hand up and stop me too. But the uh, but Indi Indianapolis and some other cities also have a slash with a county associated with it. Those are generally what we we refer to as unigovs, and and a unigov is where um, the city and the county have uh, dual combined operations, mostly even to where their budget uh, is combined. Not necessarily always the case. But um, it, it's, it's an important distinction, uh, but it's not necessarily, I don't think, something to keep you from selecting a city or compel you to select that city one way or another. I, I think we've named about a dozen cities, maybe 11, 11 or 12. Commissioners, do you feel comfortable going with those that have been named in this conversation? Yes, yeah, as long as we're including the core peer cities that we missed on our suggestions, yeah. Well, just, just to be clear, let me name them off uh, so we're all in agreement what we're talking about. Austin, Baltimore, Charlotte, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Denver, Detroit, Indianapolis, Louisville, Nashville, and Pittsburgh. Yes. Are, there, are there any other cities you would like to see included in that uh, in that list? Not at this time. Thank you. I think that's good for right now. Yeah. Okay, okay fine. Uh, is, is that uh, is that adequate uh, direction, Greg? Uh, I, I I believe it is. The only concern I would have uh, is that there is always a survey response rate and it's never 100%. Mm -hmm. uh, with 11, I believe that's what I counted there, 11 cities, uh, we might get, just going from experience here, we might get responses from seven or eight of them. Mm -hmm. and, and if that's okay uh, with the commission, certainly I'm fine with that. Um, uh, it, it, and, and it's also something that once we find out what the response rate is, we can always go back out and survey additional cities. I'll, I'll certainly do everything I can to um, get on the phone and email and, you know, hey, can you help me out with this and, and provide this information? Um, but certainly we could add uh, cities later if we get a lower response rate. No, I'm, I'm thinking that, that uh, for Greg's assignment, we should figure out now what other cities that might be, if uh, just so uh, that we're not waiting someplace on down the line uh, for uh, HR to provide additional information that may be further. Um, uh, does that make sense? Yeah, I would err on the side of cho choosing more cities so you just make you ensure you have more to kind of look at um, exactly. going down the line. Um, so. I maybe suggesting, I think there's 11 cities he said, um, maybe suggesting 15 or 16. Um, so if your response rate, that will get you at least three to four more cities. In the past, the commissions have selected closer to like 18 to 20 cities, which is kind of why this list is so robust and the, the list before this was even more robust. Um, I guess it just depends on how much information you all are wanting to have from other cities. And if you think that um, you're wanting to do a narrower scope because the cities that you think that you have picked you feel like fit more succinctly. Um, but I am a person that believes you can never have too much information. So um, if there are other cities we were caught on the fence about, it might be helpful to include those cities um, now. So that way Greg can put the ask out. And, and commissioners, as far as my um, workload with that, um, all it involves is sending the same message out and just adding, um, a, you know, a couple more cities or however many more you would like to add to it. So it, it um, doesn't matter one way or another to me. We can do 11. We can do more. So what's stopping us from just going with everybody on the list? Yeah, I, ag from I agree. 18, and then we'll have that 18 comparison as well because they, that's who they surveyed as well. Sure, we can do that. 
Yeah, I can't think of any cities that aren't on this list that I would want to see. So. Is, Keisha, does that sound uh, okay with you? Yes, that sounds okay to me. And I was just trying to look up the largest cities. Um, and right back to my earlier comment, and San Jose is number 10. I haven't been able to find 11 or 12 yet. But I would say, I mean, if it's just as easy as sending out a survey, then definitely this list. And then I would like to send it to, you know, maybe um, cities that are 9 through 12, if we're 14 or 9 through 13. Uh, y yes, Commissioner. Um, actually, Darlene uh, has pulled that information up. We've got it right here. Uh, San Jose is 10. Austin is 11. Jacksonville is 12. Uh, Fort Worth is 13. And we are 14. I, I didn't know Austin had grown that much, but probably from the census recently. Well, um, yeah. given the discussion... Um, why don't you go ahead and and uh, do the entire list? Okay, I'll uh, do was that. Was there something sure. else that we wanted to include besides this? Was there? Uh, plus San Jose. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say San Jose. Plus San Jose. Okay. The other three cities that were named in the top uh, nine through thirteen are already on the list. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Is there any further discussion on that? Okay. Let's uh, move along then to. Uh, Where are we here? The next thing um, would be Chair Kassler to talk about the tentative schedule going forward and how um, often you would like to meet. Um, I suggest it every other week, but if you all feel like there's more work to be done in meeting every other week, it's really up to you. Um, but I suggest it every other week. And um, I chose Wednesdays arbitrarily, so <laughs> don't feel tied to Wednesdays. Um, but I think just discussing when you would like to meet in terms of timing and what day. Um, I found that it's helpful for viewers if the commission is meeting on a consistent day so they know that, you know, every other week the commission is going to meet at this day and this time versus switching it up. However, um, there is flexibility and you all can choose to um, meet at what best meets your convenience. Okay, may, I, may I interject for just one second? I apologize. Um, I have another meeting at 1130 that I have to attend, so I'm going to sneak out of here in about five minutes. I feel like we're far enough along in the agenda that need for legal counsel is probably pretty low, but I just didn't want to be rude and get up and walk out without making that announcement. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, commissioners, uh, <clears throat> how do you feel about uh, the meeting schedule that Naya has proposed? The meeting schedule works for me. I do have one uh, travel conflict on the 16th, but I think as long as you all have quorum and I can, if it's live streamed or even if it's not, I can watch it after and weigh in. So I wouldn't be in favor of moving that date just for me if you all are still gonna have quorum, but outside of that, the dates look great to me. Is that February 16th, Commissioner, or March 16th? March 16th, okay. Um, Sarah, how are the, you about the that? days are fine. It's just a matter of timing because some of the days I will have conflicts during the day. Um, but if they were all evening, I could attend all of them. Okay. I know that's not everybody's favorite time to me, but. I mean, it's really up to you all about what works best for you all. Um, if evenings is better for the commission as a collective, that's fine. Or if you need to alternate between evenings on some and during the day on others. That's also fine. I think as long as the, the, the cadence is on the same day, I think time we have a little bit more flexibility with. Um, are there any of you that, the only, the only thing that I will say is that we do have to uh, kind of alert security and uh, do a few other things so that people know that they're gonna have to stay later on those, on those days um, when we have meetings in the evening, which is fine and has been done before. Um, the upside to doing it during the day is that we don't have to necessarily worry about navigating other council meetings um, because council does hold a, hold a lot of hearings and things in the evenings. And so sometimes we have to navigate that schedule and may end up getting bumped. But um, that's just something to consider when you're thinking about this. Yeah. So why, don't we, why don't we propose these dates that she specified as our tentative uh, calendar. And as time goes by, uh, we can confirm the tentative, if that's okay? Yes. And, and uh, we'll try to speak to uh, your time mm -hmm. uh, of day uh, needs. I'm very flexible. You folks are uh, workers. 
I'm a, <laughs> I'm a pensioner. Uh, and, and I'll try to cooperate with your schedules. Great. Okay. Do we want to set a time for the second since that is our next meeting? Yes. Just to get that on. Yes. So uh, is uh, February the 2nd at 10 in yeah. the morning uh, fine with you? That works. Okay. Yeah. We'll schedule that. And, and uh, Naya, if you will confirm for us that, that our uh, two missing commissioners will be able to make that. We obviously want to have a quorum to, to be able to hold a commission meeting, but I would hope that we could, uh, given the size of our commission, that we uh, uh, could have all uh, in attendance. Okay? Yes, I will work on that. And then I will send this out updated because I just realized a typo that is on this version of it that's not on my other computer version of it. That is the perks of working from home in two different computers. Mm -hmm. um, but I will um, be sure to share this information um, in an email that the next meeting is, will be February 2nd at 10 a.m. Mm -hmm. We will likely next time be in 225, which is the conference room at the end of the hallway. Um, that conference room is where we will tend to meet because I think it's a little bit more um, better for discussions. So we're all kind of sitting around the table and having discussions. Um, and we won't necessarily need the uh, screens and things like that. And there's cameras in that room as well. They just had a technical difficulty today that they weren't able mm -hmm. to remedy. So. Um, it is my hope that that's where we'll be next time. Um, I will ensure that there is a public notice that goes out and that I will, I will reach out to Mr. Lafayette to um, ensure that he will be able to join us. Um, and as long as he's able to join us, uh, we should be good to go for next time. Okay. Uh, is there any uh, further comments from any of the representatives of the various elected officials in HR as well? Commissioners, do you have other uh, items for us to consider? Okay, if not, we're adjourned, and we'll see you on uh, February the 2nd at 10 a.m. That was easy. Worked out perfect. <clears throat> Times are perfect.